Uh, my wife and I uh, came in out to our side to serve the youth and family, and uh, we are very, very encouraged to be a part of the, the Kansas City Church, amen? And uh, as uh, Clarissa, as uh, Clarissa mentioned, uh, there is a middle school hanger afterward, and so I want to make sure all our middle schoolers and parents come out to that, so I will be out there, so really that was for me. So that I don't uh, uh, break the kneecap or something out there trying to, trying to roll the stick. So it's been, it's been a little while for a run. But I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to give, that the messaging around taking care of one another. And uh, you know, I've never been in a situation like Dory in a hurricane, that, that type of uh, intense situation where your family, your house, all of that is being relocated. I've never seen something even just the opportunity to be able to pray and to be able to give, and to me is encouraging. So I appreciate us being able to participate in the giving and the serving of not just our brothers and sisters around the world, but those who are in need. And so I believe that that's the heart of Jesus, amen? Yeah. So that is very, very encouraging. Thank you for those who, that's on your heart, to uh, rally us together to be able to give to that. You know, and that uh, leads me to our topic for this evening. All right. This morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's evening <it's> summer. <laughs> we need a church. We're going to be talking about being a church. And um, what if I were to tell you to stop going to church and be the church? Oh. Attendance here is important, but it's not what's most important. God has placed us in community. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about God's vision for us as his community. Just north of San Francisco, there's some woods. An incredible forest that causes all who venture there to stand in awe of the strength and endurance of the sequoia trees. You guys heard of the sequoia trees? Amazing. The sequoia trees are sometimes referred to as the largest living things on earth, reaching almost 250 feet into the sky, and sometimes standing for as much as 1,500 years. How do the sequoia trees grow tall and strong for, through the centuries? You might be surprised that it's not how deep their roots are, although that's what I thought. While the roots are, may not, while the roots not being deep may be a surprise to you, it's actually, the roots are only four feet in the ground. They don't go probably that deep at all. In fact, they get their strength and their longevity can be contributed to the other sequoia trees surrounding them. And supporting them and keeping them strong. While their roots only go about four feet deep, their roots intermingle with other sequoia trees next to them, leading them to centuries of growth and maturity. The sequoia trees, I believe God provided that as an example for us as a community. Our lives, in order for us to be strong, and mature and withstand life's challenges, our roots have to be intervening. Our lives have to be intervening as a community. God gives us this as a picture. In the same way that no sequoia tree stands alone, no Christian is transformed alone. No Christian matures alone. We're designed just like the sequoia trees to live within community. You know, if you look at uh, John 17,
Well, y'all just got down there. Come on. John 17 it says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I are one, may they also be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. I love that complete unity. Not just partial unity, not just hanging out, not just liking to lead each other a little bit. Complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I love Jesus' prayer here. He's praying to uh, his prayer goes beyond just his twelve apostles to all the believers, to all of his followers. And his prayer is simple that they may be one, just as he and the Father, him and God and the Holy Spirit is one. God's prayer is that we're united as his people, just as him and the Holy Spirit. You know, in the beginning. Jesus was there with God in the Holy Spirit, right? And he, ever since the first sin, has been trying to reconcile us to be a people, to be one, just as he is one. In the way that God, in the way that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, their, their love and their desires and their mission, they're one that cannot be separated. You can't tell one from the other. That's God's desire for us. To look just like that. Community literally means common unity. The definition of community is a group of people who are united with a common belief system, set of values, and mission. You see, it's more than us just being part of the same church. It's more than us being part of the same small group. It's us being the church. Living and thriving and functioning as a community. <laughs> a community of people who share Jesus' desires. The things that are on Jesus' heart are equally on our hearts. Yeah. We're sharing in Jesus' mission, his purpose. What gets him up in the morning, we don't go to sleep, but what gets him up in the morning right. is with the same thing that gets us up in the morning. The things that excite him, the, the things that uh, are, are most pressing and most urgent on his heart, that's what's on our heart as a people. The things that trouble him, that concern him, we look around and we have those same concerns. Why? Because we're unified as a community. In the way that God only exists as community with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, we're designed as followers to only live as community. Let's pray. Now that Father, we are here today, God asking and begging as Jesus did centuries ago, Father, for a deeper sense of unity. God, that we can live and love one another in the way that you designed and that you called us to, Father. God, we know that you have a heart and a desire to reconcile the world to yourself. And we are grateful, we're honored, we're humble, and we're challenged to partner with you in that mission. God, pray for this time and pray for us as your people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. The community, there we go, Ooh, I like that. Thank you, Sean, Amy, folks. The community of Jesus. So what does this look like, this community that we're talking about? The community that Jesus envisioned. This community, it begins with us being unified in our surrender to Jesus. If you look at his prayer here, he's praying that we are one just as he is one. That we that we will know and we center all of our thoughts, all of our affection, our children, 
to him. That he is Lord of our life. That's where it begins. But yet it's demonstrated with our devotion to one another. How we engage and how we interact in our relationships with one another. But yet the mission and the influence is to the outside world. It begins with our surrender to Jesus. It continues with our, how we demonstrate devotion to one another. And it continues with the mission to influence the lost world. So I want to talk about three things. Two this week and then we'll continue on next week. So this week we're going to talk about community that perfects. And then secondly, community that protects. Okay. Community that perfects and community that protects. And then next week we'll continue our series with community that preaches. Go ahead and turn with me now Philippians chapter 1 verse 3. Community that perfects. Confess. Yeah, what's that talking about? Confess and protect. Perfect. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, Every time you cross my mind, I break out an exclamation of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a triggered prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up until now. There has been, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God who started a great work in you and would keep it and bring it to flourish and finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. I love this passage. I love Paul's emotion here as he speaks to the church, as he it oozes out just his confidence concerning their spiritual maturity. Hey, you know, I'm confident in that, that the work that God began in you long ago when you made Jesus Lord, that, that's going to continue until Christ returns. He's urging them and he's imploring them to continue in the faith. And he says, hey, I am confident that it will continue until the end. You know, they've journeyed through challenges and trials. They've seen some difficult things. They've endured persecution. They've endured hardship. They've endured challenges in their faith. So what makes Paul so confident that they will be continuing towards spiritual maturity until the end? It's the community. In verse 4, of the uh, NIV, it says, uh, because of your partnership in the gospel. You see, it's because of their partnership in the gospel is how they'll remain faithful. And not just remain faithful, but grow and thrive to, towards spiritual maturity. This word partnership in the Greek is uh, it's, uh, translated as uh, quantity. Say that with me. Koinonia. 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 That word means fellowship. See, it's uh, more than just hanging out. But if you look at the Greek and what fellowship meant, what koinonia meant in the Greek, it had deep, deep roots centered in them coming together in a deep love and partnership to one another. It was their lives intertangled and intermeshing to where you couldn't tell one person's life from another. In the way that one person would love, they would extend themselves beyond just hanging out. There was a sacrificial love. You've heard of brotherly love, right? Philadelphia, brotherly love. This was a different kind of love. It went much, much deeper. It's that I'm giving my life for you. I'm invested and engaged and part It's an active participation in one another's lives. That's, when you look at uh, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, 42, what does it say? It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship in the prayer. This word fellowship 
is the same word there as partnership, as fellowship. It's, they devoted themselves towards spiritual maturity through the community. When they became disciples, they just threw themselves into that community. It was no longer Christian, my life. It was no longer church life, my life. It was no longer church brands, my brands. It was all one. My life is the church. Jesus' community, Jesus' vision for community happens through us participating in one another's lives. It's more than just a an attendance at church. It's more than just being a part of the same small group. It's more than just hanging out. It's a deep commitment to one another. Those things are good. That's the bare minimum. Amen? Right. God is perfecting us, his people, through the community. You know, I think about a couple years ago, me and a couple friends, we decided to hang out and start talking about it. It was a few, maybe four, five, six couples got together and started talking about our marriage. And it was, uh, the goal was just to uh, love one another, encourage one another, build one another up in our marriages. And that uh, one couple facilitated, facilitated that time. And I remember going through and we're having fun and we're playing games and then they start talking about uh, 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 your spouse, the husband-wife relationship and having deep connection with one another and your spouse being your best friend. And, and, and I remember talking about how you, you Vulnerable with your spouse, and you share things with your spouse that you never share with anybody else. And I remember my heart just kind of sinking because that's not how I felt. You see, I was in marriage. I, there was so much about my relationship with Kim that I wanted to, I would share some things with her, but I would actually approach some of the fellas first and kind of share things with them first. Because I wanted to protect my wife. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. It's like, I don't want to tell her everything because I want to protect her from certain things. And what that did was, it kept our relationship at a surface level. And after a few years of marriage, she would make these comments. Man, I just feel like you just want to be single. I mean, you just want to hang out with a fellow. Like, what? Are you single? No. Being <laughs> yeah. single is awesome, and that was cool, but. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it didn't click for a while, but till, till actually, till that time, um, that I realized that what she meant was we're not connected. Right. I don't know the inner workings of who you are, your, your thought, those dark things that you don't tell anyone, but you tell your wife, you tell your spouse. I didn't have that type of relationship, and she desired a deeper connection with me. And uh, it was right after that time I started, we, we got other couples in, and we started connecting with uh, two to three other couples uh, at different times, and, uh, 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 and working through our relationship and deepening our friendship and, and, and learning how to share with her things that I, I uh, would formally protect her from. You know, this is how I truly feel. This is how I'm thinking about this. I, didn't, I don't just make a decision and come and tell you what that decision is. No, let me tell you kind of how I'm thinking about it. We can wrestle through this together. That was a very, very difficult 